well. We're in this series called Generation, uh, a vision for what's next. And we've been talking for the last couple of weeks about our responsibility to give the gospel to the next generation. You know that we live in a culture right now that is a culture of divisiveness, a culture of fear, a culture of doubt. But thank God the gospel of Jesus Christ is the antidote for that. It is the cure for that. And Jesus offers the hope of the world. So as a church, we have this opportunity during this pandemic to come back to what our vision is. And you know our vision, bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And as a church, we have made a commitment to reach the next generation for Christ. Uh, and I've told you this, that the majority, according to studies, the majority of people that ever get saved do so before their 16th birthday, about 80%, which tells us that's the wisest place to spend our money, to put our energy, to put our emphasis, because that's the greatest return on investment. And so today, we've got something a little bit special, I think, that's going to be an encouragement to you. I'm going to be uh, talking to you today from Psalm 127 about how you can make a difference. But we have joining me in just a few minutes, we have our children's pastor, Chelsea Kensell, and uh, our uh, youth pastor, Jesse Wild. And both of them are, uh, they've been on staff here less than a year. It's coming up on a year. And God is really, really using them. And so we're going to be talking to you, not just families with children, Uh, or grandparents with grandchildren. We're talking to everyone. This applies to you. And so we're going to talk about how you can make a difference in reaching the next generation for Christ. I take our text today from Psalm 127, and I'm going to read the entire psalm, so you guys just be ready for that. I know I have it divided up. But I'm going to read the entire psalm, make a couple comments, and then we're going to bring our panel out, okay? Uh, Look with me in what the Bible says there in Psalm 127, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. Now, what does that verse tell us? That you can't do it by yourself. It it is impossible for you regarding salvation to do it by yourself. You don't earn your way to heaven. You don't earn God's favor. You don't earn God's love. It's freely given through his grace. Hallelujah. Thank God. Praise God for that. You don't have to earn it. But the fact is, we cannot do this by ourselves. If you're a single person looking for someone to marry, listen closely, let the Lord build the house. He's better at it than you. And and don't sacrifice your future for the immediate. There are many people that, because they're afraid of being alone or being lonely, they sacrifice what they know is right, and as a result, they get into a marriage that is loveless and will crush them, unless the Lord builds the house. For those of you that uh, have uh, children, you know that unless the Lord builds the house, You're wasting your time. You can't do it by yourself. Obviously, you need the church, but you need God to intervene on your behalf. That doesn't mean that we don't put forth effort. That doesn't mean that we don't do our part, but it means that by faith, we trust God. So no matter who you are, no matter where you are, if you're a single parent, if you're a blended family, or if you're the nuclear family, you and I need God's help. Can't do it alone. Can't do it by ourselves. Let's look at the next verse. He said, it is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat for, listen to this, God gives rest to his loved ones. You know what that's telling us? That all this worry does no good. Isn't it true that we worry a lot? A lot of people worry during this pandemic. We're worried about the economy. We're worried about the election. We're worried about our job, and, and rightly so. I'm not, I'm not downplaying the importance of these things. But let me tell you how to have joy and peace during a pandemic. You do not look at the circumstances, but you keep your eyes on God. That's the way to have joy. That's the way to get through it. That's the way to be a part of what God is doing in your life, and you're trusting him, and you give him all of your cares. For 1 Peter uh, 5, 7 says, give all your worries and cares to him, for he cares 
for you. It literally means to roll them on God. And I will literally physically practice this many times during my prayer time. God, I'm worried. God, I'm anxious. And I will literally just physically make the motion of rolling my anxieties onto the Lord. And why is he saying that? The fact is, it's pointless for you to worry over something you have no control over. Uh, some of you are worried because your kids are at home and you're worried about their education, you're worried about their health, you're worried about school starting back. Some of you are single parents and you're worried about your children because uh, you don't have them all the time and you're worried about how they're going to turn out. And some of you have blended families and you have my kids, your kids, and our kids. And, and you don't have your kids with you all the time and so you're worried about it. Others of you have teenagers and you're worried because maybe the interaction is getting a little tense. Can I just give you a little bit of encouragement? It'll get better, okay? They act like teenagers because they're teenagers, all right? So that's perfectly normal. But the truth of the matter is, God is the one that gives us rest. God is the one that we turn our worries and our cares to, no matter who you are, no matter what you're like as a parent. Some of you have children that are grown adults and they've wandered far from God. In fact, some have children that are running the opposite direction of God and you're worried. Can I just encourage you, unless the Lord builds a house, it's not going to matter what you do. And for you to worry is not to trust God. And what God tells us to do is this, and I want you to get it, no matter if you have kids in college, uh, kids that are adults, kids that are small children, whether you're worried about your grandkids, God says he is the one that builds the house. He is the one that will give us rest. And that means we need to rest in him. I think moms are professional warriors uh, by nature. And part of that is because you're a mom, all right, and you have to worry about those kids because, let's be honest, they're really dumb when they're young, right? I mean, they do some dumb things. The Bible says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. How many know what the rod of correction is? Were you raised in a home? Some of you don't know what that is, all right? Seriously, all right? Seriously, nobody knows what... I used to get the crap beat out of me, all right? So uh, you say, well, did you deserve it? Absolutely, all right? Uh, did, it, did, it, uh, did it warp you? As far as you know, it did not, all right? So uh, the truth is, though, God is the one that gives us rest. Well, let me read this and uh, get Chelsea and Jesse out here. It says, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. I want to pray for the next generation. I want to pray for all of us that we will be a part of reaching teenagers and children with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Raising them up to be champions for Jesus Christ. That's our goal. That's our job. That is our calling as a church. And so we want to talk to you today for a little bit about how you can make a difference. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus and the gospel. Help us as a church to be very serious about reaching this next generation for Christ. Lord, I pray for the children. So many of them haven't been back yet, Lord. I pray that you give their parents courage and, Lord, allow them to be able to come back and participate and be a part of the church services. Lord, for our teenagers, God, many of them are coming back. But, Lord, I pray that you'd help them and grow them. And, Lord, for our young adults and for our millennials and the next generation, God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us to reach this generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is in Jesus' name that I pray and ask all these things. Amen, amen, amen. Well, God bless you for being here today. I want us to welcome uh, Chelsea and Jesse to the stage at this time. We'll give them a good Avalon welcome as they come out today. All right, what we're going to do is we're just going to kind of talk about um, this passage that we read, and we're going to talk about the message that you guys have for our church and for our parents and for those that 
are wanting to be involved. So let's kind of start right where we talked about at the beginning. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. So what this is teaching us is that um, it all begins with your relationship with God. That's the most critical part. And so the question really is, why is that important? And how can we influence the next generation? Let's start with Jesse. Yeah, no, I, th- I think that's a huge question the church needs to answer. Not just the church, but church and parents need to answer together at the same time. And so when I got these questions, I was trying to find other verses that backed up Psalm 127. And the, the, the best part about this is I found another part in Psalms that backs this up. And what I found was out of Psalm 78, verse 4, and it says, We will not hide from their children, but tell of the coming generations of the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. And so I think the church in and of itself as a whole has a huge responsibility to tell the next generation, to tell our kids of what God has done. And basically, to put it straightforward, the question of why is it important that we know God, I think the answer is simply because we can't teach the next generation of a God that we don't know. I think that's what it all boils down to, is that we can't teach someone of a God that we pretend to understand, that we pretend to have a relationship with. Kids are going to see right through that. And so for me personally, I think what Psalms in 78 and in 127 is saying is that the reason it is important for parents and for leaders of the next generation to have a relationship with God is because you cannot lead someone to someone that you are not currently following. They're eventually going to break off and follow someone else. They're eventually going to believe something else. It's almost like, not, not to toot my own horn here, but like a month ago when I was doing a message up here talking about being an example and being an ambassador of God, I think a huge point that I was saying, especially in the story of Matthew, was people can be deceived and think they're following God when in reality they're not. You're not going to lead anyone to God, whether it's children, whether it's young adults. You're not going to lead anyone to God if you pretend to have a relationship with God or if you just think you have a relationship with God. It starts with you, and we can't expect to lead anyone anywhere if we don't personally have Jesus in our hearts. So I think that's a huge point uh, that Psalm is trying to make I I sent out a a tweet um, last week, and if I can remember it, Basically, it says that half-hearted Christianity does nothing. Yep. That if you want to change the world, you got to go all in. Yeah. And that's the challenge for our church because we don't want to be half-hearted Christians. We don't want to be a church that is just entertainment. We want to bring people, wherever they are, into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. So that, that's a huge part of that. Yeah. And in our youth ministry, um, our philosophy is that we want this to be gospel-centered, that we want our children to grow up to be champions for Jesus. We want our uh, kids to make an impact in the schools, in the communities uh, where they live, and uh, that, you know, that's what we're about. Absolutely. And so, well, Chelsea, uh, tell us how that works in our children's ministry and what your thoughts are for our church on that. So let's be honest, kids see through everything. They want to know. They have curiosity. They're going to ask that why question. If you're a parent or you've been around kids and haven't heard the why, 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 you need to spend some more time listening. And the honest truth is kids can, they can digest the word of God. They can digest this message. They get it and they can lead with this. And I always go back to the Great Commission. We were told to go and make disciples. We were not told to go talk to adults. We were not told to go talk to leaders. We were told to go and make disciples. There's no age limit on that. There's no looking down on them because they're young. I mean, I can think of an example just this summer of one of our kids who convicted my own heart when he was standing up here praying in a room full of adults with such conviction and passion of knowing the Lord is going to do what he's praying our kids don't have to have it dumbed down. This is not childcare. This is them taking ownership of their walk. But here's the thing, they're watching every one of you adults in this room. They're watching me. They're watching to wonder, well, if you're making me memorize verse, if you're making me read the Bible, if you're making me pray, what are you doing? And kids are gonna see through it. And if you're not doing it, they're not gonna see value in it because they're gonna be like, you're a bunch of words. Where's your actions? Where's your actions in this? And the fact is, in the children's ministry, it is also gospel-centered by command from the Word of God. Uh, But also, I think that to touch on what you said, the idea that children don't understand is just simply wrong. Um, I can remember sermons 
from when I was eight, nine, and ten, and I'm not talking about children's sermons. I remember uh, a sermon that was preached in a revival in the church that I attended. I was 10 years old. I still remember what the, uh, the evangelist talked about, and it made a huge impact in my life. So uh, kids can get it, okay? They get it. Now, I, I want to say this. There, there are, I, I guess, if you will, churches uh, that they want to have this philosophy, but they're angry about it, it seems like. They're mad about everything. They hate everything. Uh, what their church stands for is what they're known to hate, not what they're known to love. And we don't want to be that. We don't want to raise uh, hypocritical children. We don't want to raise critical children. We don't want to raise Pharisees, okay? So for us, there has to be joy in what we're doing. And um, as a church, we believe that God gives joy. The Holy Spirit, one of the, uh, one of the gifts of the Spirit according to Galatians chapter 5, is joy. Now, joy is not happiness. Happiness is based solely on circumstances. Um, if I won the lottery, woo, I'm happy. If all my friends and relatives ask me for some of the money, woo, I'm sad, all right? So, uh, you know, the fact is uh, we all are uh, going to face circumstances that are not very happy, but we can have joy. And the joy of the Holy Spirit, the joy of serving God, it's all about our attitude and the parents' attitude. And I would say this, um, and for those of you watching online, when you bring your children, and by the way, it's bringing people. That's our vision, bringing people. You've got to bring your kids, invite your neighbors, invite the people you work with, bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. When you come expecting and you, you do that with your children, they're going to get a lot more out of it. And, and studies show that parents that bring their kids and are active with them at church, serving together, okay, serving, that's the key, that the vast majority of those children never quit going to church. Um, but not true with, with those that don't. So anyway, uh, so it begins with a relationship with God, and that's critical for what we do. The, the next verse says it's useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. So we must work from a position of rest. So how can we rest and depend on God to reach the next generation? Yeah. No, I think, I think resting and depending on God are, are two things that, that go hand in hand that you need to be able to understand um, in order to work as God has called you to work. Uh, one of my favorite passages about this in action actually comes out of Proverbs 29, uh, verse 17. It says, discipline your son, and he will give you rest. He will give delight to your heart. And I love that because it says, discipline your son, and he will give you rest. And if I'm being honest, I think a, a big reason and a lot, a lot of people why they are continuing to search for rest is because they're searching for the rest without doing the work. Oh, yeah, we're going in today. Like, I, I'm just saying, I think a big reason about why parents and about why leaders of the next generation are constantly looking for rest is because they're unwilling to do the disciplining, they're unwilling to do the hard work, and they're unwilling to lead their kids in the way that they ought to go. But Proverbs is telling us, kind of like how Psalms is telling us, that when we lead our children, when we discipline them, when we continue to grow a passion and a desire in their heart for God, that is truly where we find the rest. I think the rest comes from doing the godly work. There is something about doing what God has called you to do that will provide you with the rest that you can't experience anywhere else. I think that's what the, the point that the Bible is trying to get across because we can rest easy knowing that we are doing our part. Um, it, it's just, it, it doesn't sound right because what I'm saying, what the Bible is pretty much saying is that rest comes from doing work, but it's saying that rest comes from doing the right work. Rest comes from doing the work that God has called you to do for your kids and for the next generation. I know, I know a great example of this um, happened when I was at a church in Rockford. This, this is one of the greatest stories I've heard. Um, the head pastor of the church I attended in Rockford gave us a story and gave us an example um, about a shepherd um, and what their job truly was back in the day when it came to shepherding sheep. Because he said, if parents and if leaders are related to shepherds a lot in the Bible, which they are, we can get a lot from actually studying what the job of a shepherd was. 
And he said what shepherds did besides just guiding the flock is that when one went astray, they would go and get it, as we all know. But what they also said was that when one sheep was getting attacked, they would do whatever it took to get the sheep back. Even if it meant holding on to it and pulling it from the jaws of a bear or pulling it from the jaws of a lion, they would do whatever it took to get the sheep back. And the greatest part about this story was he said that even if the shepherd lost the sheep, even if the sheep died and got lost in the ways of the wilderness, it would gather up its remains and go back to his master and said, I lost one, but I tried. And I think that is the mindset that our parents need to have. Yes, we cannot always make decisions for our kids. Yes, there will be a point where our kids need to grow up and live life on their own, but God forbid I ever stand before God and never say that I tried. God forbid I ever say that I never tried to do the godly work, that I never tried to get the rest that he had to offer me because I never tried to create that desire in their heart. So. Well, and I love the idea of, of the picture, the metaphor of shepherding. Um, but also in Genesis, we know that God created everything, and then after six days, he rested. He did this for our example. God wasn't tired. He did this for us. And I've told you before, the Hebrew words there, uh, when God spoke, he created. He was breathing out. When he rested, that word meant that he breathed in. So he's like catching his breath. Now, was God tired? Was he out of breath? No. He was doing this for us. And yet we find in Genesis that Adam and Eve, before the fall, God commanded them. First of all, he commanded them to eat of every tree of the garden except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God's goodness and grace. And he told them to fill the earth. And they were to rest first and then work. They were to work from their rest in the Lord. And I really believe that's uh, a beautiful picture of what we're talking about here is that we know that God is the one that gives rest. We must rest in him by faith, uh, following what he says, but from that rest, we work. Doesn't, grace doesn't mean that you don't work, that you don't try, as you said. Yeah. But rather, it is about resting by faith in God and working from that. That is true for your family, your children as well. So, Chelsea, how would you say that we do this in children's ministry? And what does, what does that look like? So I'm going to take a little bit different. I like the verse in Psalms 46.10, and it says, Be still and know that I am God. And with that, be still, in some translations it says, Stop fighting. And I think those words really resonate, I think, with kids because our culture today is fighting for our kids. It's fighting for their attention. It's fighting for them to be absorbed in extracurricular activities. It's fighting for their school to become the best thing in, they can possibly be in. It's fighting for them to be on the tablets, on the screens. It's fighting for their attention. And so they're constantly in this state of, I've got to go, 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 go. No, no, no. Be still. Be still. Take that moment. Take that moment to disconnect. Take that moment to stop putting pressure on yourself. Take that moment to breathe. We've got to stop and think that we have to give and push our kids into everything. That's not what they need. They need Jesus, y'all. They need him to be who's guiding their life. It's not about being an A-plus student. It's not about being the best dancer there is. Those are all great things, but where's the priority in their life? Don't let the world keep them in the state of fighting. Give them a place of peace and lead them there. One of the things I've said about our current generation is that I believe our children are probably tired. They go, 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 go. And as a parent, you turn into nothing more than a chauffeur, right, as they get a little bit older. But I do believe that setting the priority and making sure that they have that rest time in their life as well is incredibly important. And I would add this, that as a parent, if you don't make the priority of reading the Bible praying so that you can get rest for your soul, and from that rest you have the authority in your children's lives, then uh, you're going to get worn out as well. Yeah. And so, um, but let's look at the, the next verse. It says, uh, children are a gift from the Lord and they are a reward from Him. And what we're learning from that is that we're called to be stewards. So how do we steward our children and our teenagers 
And what is the responsibility of the church and what's the responsibility of the parents? Yeah, I, I'm glad you said the second part because I think that, that there's a two-way to answer this. It's by answering what the responsibility of the church, you will then see what the responsibility of the parents is and vice versa. Um, I think the great responsibility, another verse that I found is actually in Proverbs 22, verse 6. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And I love that verse because it shows from a parent and from a church's standpoint that both things impact their lives for the better, is that both sides train and they will not forget the ways even when they are older. And you can ask me and Chelsea this question all day long because one thing that we have said from the get-go before we even decided to take part of this panel is that if we truly claim to be training our kids in the ways of God, we must realize that once a week at church is not enough. Like, we have to get past that mindset. If all your kids do, the only Bible reading, the only praying they do is once a week every Sunday, that truly cannot be enough. Because the church can do its best to teach, but the parents have to do their best to lead. The church can do its best to teach them the gospel. The church can do its best to disciple them outside of a Sunday. But parents and their home is where the leading and where the foundation takes place. Uh, I, think, I think of a video. This is, this is going to be a, a funny one for, for someone in the audience. But um, Dan Maxwell showed me a, a video by a pastor named Vody Bauckham, and he is probably one of my favorite pastors right now because he just teaches the Bible from such a practical standpoint and does it in such an amazing way to show you that the Bible still applies today. And he, he sent me a video. <laughs> he sent me a video titled, Why Youth Ministry Shouldn't Exist. And so we're sitting there, and I'm watching this video, and it's, he's literally going through, and he hit two points that I thought were the greatest points that not even I, being youth pastor, could argue with. And he said... Two reasons why youth ministry may be so damaging in the culture that we are in right now is because, one, youth ministry in a lot of places teaches parents that they don't need to do their job, and two, it teaches kids that it's okay to water down the gospel. And that killed me. Like, listening to that video, because he, he talked about it from a perspective of saying, the church is actually being okay with a ministry taking over a parent's role. Like, that is not, that's not even biblical. Like, you have to take so many verses out of context in order to end on that result. If you think that the church can replace the influence that you have on your kid's life and their relationship with God, you are completely wrong, and you need to get back into what the Word of God actually says. But from the other standpoint, I think the church needs to get out of that mindset. And that's one of the biggest things that I've been trying to do since I've got here. You can ask any leader and any student, my biggest priority when we would get back there on Sundays for small group or when we met on Wednesday nights and when we continue to do that is always to teach the Bible first. It is always to teach the Bible first and not to just try to put on a show to entertain you. And it's just, it, it hurts me to understand that so many students show up and think, if you can win my attention, then I will listen to what the Bible says. Because it's not like we're teaching two different truths, one in here and one in the back room. We are teaching from the same source. And yes, I get kids learn at a different pace, and so we may need to teach at a different pace. But at the end of the day, we are teaching the exact same thing that people are learning in here. We can't just water down the gospel for that exact reason. And a huge, huge example of this is when we, we just kicked back off small groups on Sundays. And I, I think this is either last week or, or a week ago, we, we, were, we were broken off. We were talking about doubt, and we were talking about, like, what you should do from a biblical perspective if you have doubt in your heart. And we talked about this, and I asked the room that we had, I said, how many of you have doubted God, and what do you doubt God with? And none of them answered the question. And I said, have you ever doubted God before? And all of them said no. And so then I said, have any of you trusted God before? And they all just sat there and stared at me. And I remember I was sitting there with Jason, it was just a completely just culture shock because I sat there and I asked, I asked this in a joking way, and it surprised me to see the result, but I asked, the last time we met back up was in March. Who has read your Bible since March? There were some students that actually had to sit and think, have I read my Bible since March? And that, that hurt. I was like, good gosh, like this is just the, the culture that we are in, not just for parents, but for the church to think that the church needs to continue and continue to parent kids and when it's a parent's job and that parents need to continue to do what the church has done. I think we've got a lot of things backwards and we need to understand that it is the church's job to teach, but it is the parent's job to lead what they have been taught. So, Well, just from a practical standpoint, if you're faithful, 
And by faithful, I mean you come every week, except for when you're sick or on vacation or something of that nature, then you're going to hit 40-something Sundays a year, most likely. And if you have a blended family where your children go every other weekend, if you're faithful, you might, with your kids, get 20-something Sundays a year. Now, think about this. Let's just go with 45. 45 hours in an entire year that the church would have to train your kids. Once again, I'm not suggesting the church's role is unimportant. It's very important, okay? Um, But you have... 24-7, 24-7, 365, we have 45 hours at most, at most. And the point is this, it's a team effort. And what we want to do is to equip you to be able to raise your kids and to reach the next generation for Jesus Christ. And it's not just about your kids. Once they get out of high school, then you wipe your hands of it. No, as a church, as believers, we have a responsibility to the next generation. And we do that through building the church, being a part of the church, giving so that we can reach the next generation. Everybody that does that uh, is a part. And then I would say as well, volunteering and leading and being a champion in these ministries because yeah. it's hugely important. If I want to be a part of something that's going to impact people the most, I would be a part of our children's and student ministry. The reason for that is you're affecting the next generation. And I would really challenge you to think about that, uh, that you in some way do something that is going to help us as a church reach the next generation for Christ. What do you have uh, to add on that, Chelsea? So I'm I'm right there with Jesse. And if y'all actually were to sit down with us and ask us if either one of us should have jobs or ministries in this church, we would flat out tell you no. And here's why. Like Jesse said, that's not our job. Y'all are the leaders. We're your partners. We're the ones who come alongside you. And I'm probably going to regret saying this because I have a lot of my big kids in here. So y'all don't use this against me next week. We're the ones who come alongside you when they ask those why questions. How, how does this work? Why does this work? How do dinosaurs work into the creation story? That's always a fun one. Or a uh, about Adam and Eve's kids and how there were more kids after that. We, we come alongside you and help you with those, but y'all, 40, 45 hours a week if we're lucky. Y'all put more effort into your jobs than I get to spend with your kids. What would your boss think if you only put 45 hours into your job every week? Oh, wait, that every, is, that's one week of work. A year. A year, there so yeah, go. 45 hours in a year. You do at least 100 hours of work a week. If right? you're not, you're being lazy. No, I'm just kidding. Right? But, I mean, honestly, let's think about that. But I look back, and I could start listing off names of people from my childhood. And none of them actually directly served in kids or my student ministry. They served on the parking lot team. They served on the greeting team. But they were there faithfully every week. They learned my name. They were part of Upward, and they brought me alongside of them as a coach and mentored me because they saw something in me. That's what the church does. We come around you, and we partner with you. But y'all, it starts at home. It starts at letting your kids ask why. Because if you want to get them off the coattails of your faith and let them own it, you got to let them ask why. They've got to figure it out for themselves. Well, and I would also say this. Don't be intimidated by that, because a lot of times parents are afraid of that. What if they ask me a question I don't know the answer to? Well, if you've been a parent of a talking child, they have asked you questions that you don't have the answer to, all right? And so don't worry about that. And I will say this, you have the power of the Holy Spirit of God within you. And for those of you that think, well, I don't know that much about the Bible, read it together, Mm -hmm. okay? You don't have to know, you don't have to have a Bible college education or a seminary degree to be able to read the Bible and just by reading the Bible and praying, you will make a huge impact in the lives of your kids. Just talk to them. If all you do is take the information that they give in children's ministry and, and, and uh, youth ministry, and you just kind of talk to your kids about that once a week or whatever, you're going to make an impact. You're going to start seeing your kids develop into champions for Christ, and they are going to be what our 
mission statement says they're going to be the next generation that we reach in this growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah, agreed. Well, um, we need to wrap this up here in a moment. It says, children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands, and the church's job is to get the children to the right target. And how do we do that collectively? I think we've kind of already talked about yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and I want you to see this, parents. God compares you. The metaphor is that you're a warrior. And your children are arrows, and you've got to get them to the target. Now, there's a lot of, there's a lot of theology in that metaphor. The fact is, you've got to release them at the right time. It's sometimes hard to release your kids because we want to be the helicopter parent. You got to release them if they're going to reach the target at the right time. But also, you got to aim them at the right target. And I forget which one of you said this. I think Chelsea, you may have said it. That you know, getting an education is very important. Yes, athletics. I think it's wonderful. Uh, activities. These are wonderful, but they are not the ultimate priority. It's possible that your kid could play for the Braves one day and hit a home run in the World Series. But you're probably about just as likely to win the lottery as for that to happen, okay? Uh, it's possible that your child uh, is a musical star singing in front of hundreds of thousands of people one day, but most likely they're going to sing in the shower, all right? So that may be their audience. The, the point is this. All these things are incredibly important. We're not downplaying the importance of education. I'm an educated man. I've spent a lot of money on uh, the degrees and the advanced degrees and the graduate degrees that I have because I want to study. But listen, that's not the goal. I'd rather my children, they're adults now, I'd rather my children be broke and uneducated but in love with Jesus yeah. and serving God than I have for them to have the greatest education and a bank account full of money and not know God. Yeah. Have no relationship with God. It's incredibly important. So our job is to point them like arrows toward the target. Yeah. And uh, so let me read this last verse. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put out to shame um, when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. And that's really talking about success. That the, the one that does this, that depends on God, that rests on him, you're not worried because you're trusting God. You're letting God build the house. You're pointing your kids as arrows toward the target he says, you're going to be successful. Now, let me just say this for parents. A lot of times we feel guilty because we think maybe we could have done something different. Maybe if I'd said something different or done something different, they would have made a different choice. Can I just say this? It doesn't matter how great a parent you are, you're going to make mistakes. And that's why you rest in the Lord, okay? Okay. And your children are much, much, much more resilient than you think they are. And I would say that what you and I need to learn about this is that when we depend on God, we don't have to have this guilt complex. By the way, if your children, maybe they're not serving God right now, maybe they're not doing the right things, you keep on praying for them. You don't ever give up. You, keep, you just keep praying for them no matter how old they get. You keep praying for them. And if you feel guilty over that, uh, God created the first two humans, and both of them sinned against God. All right, so do not downplay the sin nature of your children. They're born with it, okay? And you pray, and so defining success is about their relationship with God. So uh, just wrapping this up, how would you define success, Chelsea, in, uh, in our ministry for our children and for the parents? How would you define that? Biggest thing, it's not childcare. Don't call it childcare. I, I will get on a soapbox about this. This is the church. They are the church. Whether they are in the nursery, whether they are in pre-K, whether they are in fifth grade, they are uniquely created by God and loved by him, and they have a purpose. And they need to be brought up on a foundation all the way through. This isn't just about sticking them in the back room and not letting them be seen. They have a role and a place in the church overall. And that's one of the reasons why in our ministries, children and youth ministry, we emphasize serving a lot because we don't want our kids just to go in there and be entertained. We want them to actually serve. 
uh, because if we expect adults to serve, we expect saved children to serve. Because if you're, you're wondering, there is no Holy Spirit Junior. When your kids get saved, they don't get a mini version of God in their lives. They get all of them, okay? And so what we want to do is to bring them up and lift them up and let the work of the Holy Spirit do His work in their lives. Um, and, and look, don't think that God doesn't speak to your children. If you'll get them near the flame, they're going to get hot for God. I promise you. I can remember when I was 10 years old, I knew that God had spoken to me about being a pastor. When I was 10. That was crazy. I was like, man, I, I'm thinking about playing with toy soldiers, not about anything like that. But I promise you, God will speak to your kids. You get them close to the flame. You get them close to the source. And God is going to do something in their life if you'll do it. I promise you, he will. Jesse, as we wrap this up, how would you define success? Yeah, I think I, think I would define success, especially from a church perspective, um, as doing whatever it takes to achieve what God has called the church to be. And so looking at it from that perspective, my, one of my favorite books to read regarding that is the book of Acts because it talks about the original church and what God originally wanted the church to look like and a bunch of principles of what that should look like. And so I think for me how to define success is are students allowed to go to a place where they're learning about the gospel and then in return are they going to a place where they get to continue to learn about that and be led in the same direction? So I think for me it's kind of along the lines of what you were saying and even what Jose was saying earlier is that Getting to a point, I think, where we can bring the youth to a place where they want to show up to small group and to a message to actually learn about the Bible instead of being entertained would be awesome. And I'm not saying we don't have that now, but I'm saying there are some students who I, who I have seen whenever I've done a message who will stay awake when I'm talking about a funny story, and as soon as I open the Bible, I don't even say a word. They just close their eyes. And, it, and it, it, it's, it's heartbreaking, really, to know that the desire is just not there. And so I think a huge win of what success would look like is to have students come in with that desire to learn about the Bible because the desire was made in their home. I think that is what, it, what success needs to look like, is that parents are, are leaning them and pushing them to have the desire to burn on fire for God, and at the end of the day, we're able to feed into that because of the desire that was built with their parents at their own house. So I think success would, would greatly look like teaching the Word of God, not just at church, but at their house, but also being able to teach the Word of God in a message where kids actually desire to hear what the Bible has to say. Well, and the way we do that, like we talked about last week, Proverbs uh, tells us, train up a child, that word train, that the midwives would chew up dates, they would mince dates and rub that paste on the mouth of the baby on the roof and the, uh, their mouth and their gums to create a hunger to be able to nurse, to feed. And our job is to create a hunger for God in the lives of our kids. That's not to suggest we don't have fun. We have a lot of oh, fun. Oh, no. And, no. Uh, fun, you know, I mean, we do we do a lot to reach kids on their level, okay? But we want you to know that we take seriously the Word of God. We've said this a lot here at Avalon Church. We take Jesus and the Word of God very seriously and everything else not so much um, because we're going to be flexible with that. But we believe that you can have fun serving God, that it's the best way to live. It is the most joyful way to live. It is the most peaceful way to live. It's the most exciting way to live. And so uh, that's what we want to do with, with our kids and create that environment. And it's going to, look, any church that has the emphasis on evangelism like we do, you're going to have a family just like your extended family. You got grandparents, that's people that have been around, they're mature. You got those that are providing the living for everybody, they're working and they're giving. You got those that are teenagers. They haven't quite figured it all out yet. They think that everything in the world revolves around them still. Okay, there are a lot of Christians like that. Uh, and then you got your children that need to be raised and fed. And so anytime that we cease to have people from all of those groups, we're not really fulfilling the Great Commission the way God has called us to do and using the metaphor of a family. And so that's our goal. Our belief is that we are going to see God do miracles 
in the lives of our kids, in the lives of our youth, and we believe that God's going to do a great work in this region because of our kids being on fire for Jesus. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.